Good afternoon. It's Monday, April 8th. I'm Herman Green with your midday news. To those of you watching online at onespotmedia.com, a special welcome to you. Opposition spokesman on transport, Mikhail Phillips, says the lack of commitment from the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority, JCAA, and Transport Minister Robert Montague to the findings of the probe into the fatal crash in Greenwich Town, St. Andrew on November 10, 2016, is concerning. The probe, which was conducted by the JCAA and the U.S.-based National Transportation Safety Board, uncovered several major safety breaches concerning the ill-fated aircraft and by its operator, the Caribbean Aviation Training Center. Shortcomings were also found on the part of the JCAA, which has oversight responsibility for the local airspace. Our new center has tried unsuccessfully to contact Director General of the JCAA, Naure William Singh, or Transport Minister Robert Montague. Speaking with TVJ News this morning, Opposition Spokesman on Transport Mikhail Phillips said he intends to raise the matter at the next sitting of the House of Representatives. The report itself is one that should is cause for concern, not only for for the government itself, but just the general public. And I'm expecting that the minister sh should at least, uh, at minimum, make a statement in the parliament when we do sit again. Um, I have been asking for a copy of the report myself and not being able to receive one. But it is uh, not, not in the best interest of the minister himself to keep silent on this report, but at least come to the public and, sta and state what are the measures that will be taken to ensure that incidents like these won't happen again. Mr. Phillips says the revelation by the director and CEO of the Caribbean Aviation Training Center in the Gleaner on Monday that he submitted a rebuttal to the findings, which was not included in the report, is even more troubling. As I was saying just a while ago, is that there, a lot of things are not adding up. Um, where the JCA itself, as the oversight body, um, didn't take action on some of the issues that had arisen before. And you're seeing instances that just know where the owner of the flight school said that he submitted uh, his rebuttals, and which were not responded to. So that is why we are interested in hearing some report from the JCA itself and also something from the minister on the way forward. Captain Errol Stewart told the Gleaner that he produced an eight-page rebuttal, which was submitted to JCAA Director General Nari William Singh and a copy to Transport Minister Robert Montague from October last year, in which some of the conclusions in the report were challenged. Captain Stewart says his concerns were not acknowledged. Rashane Masters, TVJ News. Political commentator Dr. Paul Ashley is weighing in on last week Thursday's by-election in East Portland. He believes that although the PNP sent their best candidate, they had no chance of winning. Dr. Ashley says PNP did not have the resources it needed to adequately fight for the seat while Anne-Marie Vaz had been working in the constituency for two years. Despite winning, however, the political commentator believes Mrs. Vaz cannot stop com campaigning in the constituency as the general election is right around the corner. This win was aided and abetted by a serious national JLP organization that was focused down there. In the general election, she won't have that. Mm -hmm. it will, she'll be left alone. Yeah. Uh, she needs help. She needs help. She has 18 months to ensure that she has a victory in the general election. I mean, this victory is a start, eh? But you, you don't want to be the shortest serving female after 75 years. Uh, you can't reduce your assistance, right? And the resources are such that it is dread. So she needs the government to come with a major project. As for the PNP's Damien Crawford, Dr. Ashley believes he has a good chance of winning in the next general election. There is one view that he should stay down there. And it's easy to reverse uh, 319 yeah, votes. votes. It's yeah. easy. But then, uh, depends on his business, depends on his house, he would have to move and be in the constituency. And not only that, he would have to ensure that he can really get the machinery up to date. Mm -hmm. Damien didn't have the time to go in there and the people feel Damien. Damien was going there with the man with the plan. He had to win to come with the plan. She's coming there and said, look here, 
I dealt with your needs. If anything, yeah, you have to yeah. express some gratitude so you'll get more help. But I am the person who was helping you. If Damien was helping them physically, he would have been all right. Dr. Ashley was speaking on TVJ's Smile Jamaica program this morning. And still reeling from last week's by-election loss, another member of the People's National Party, PNP, has responded to calls for the party president to step down. Party stalwart Maxine Henry Wilson says those calls are short-sighted. The party's Damian Crawford lost to the JLP's Anne-Marie Vaz by over 300 votes for the Portland Eastern constituency. The party was also defeated in the St. Mary's Southeastern by-election in 2017. However, Mrs. Henry Wilson, who is a former PNP general secretary, says the by-election losses alone is not reason enough for a resignation. She argues that while the public will judge a party leader based on election success, leadership goes far beyond that. You have to be able to provide a center for the the party, you have to be able to develop and articulate some kind of a vision for the party. You have to be able to earn the respect of the different levels of the party. You have to run a, a viable opposition. You have to form it. You have to ensure that you are a formidable and viable opposition. So there are different criteria for evaluation, not just an election. And therefore, I think perhaps the calls are very um, myopic. Mrs. Henry Wilson says she expects Dr. Phillips will do a full evaluation of his leadership. I think whenever a leader loses an election, he does evaluate, unless he's minded, he does evaluate his chances. He usually consults with various levels in the party for their comments. And I'm sure that um, Dr. Phillips will do that, you know, being a person who a very analytical approach to everything. Mean, meanwhile, Jamaica Labour Party General Secretary Dr. Horace Chang has waiting on the cause for Dr. Phillips to go, saying those making the demands are seeking to shortcut to fixing the PMP's problems. He asserts that that could result in a string of leadership changes. There are no shortcuts to rebuilding a party's infrastructure and engaging the wider population. And those who call for that is really looking at short foot success, which won't come. They will keep doing it and maybe end up with chain five, six, seven, eight, and that's not the way. They have, they have fundamental issues. They made significant errors in the campaign, which I won't go into, but we'll always capitalize on the errors they make. That's part of my job, is <laughs> to spot the errors and capitalize on them. And they need to go and settle their internal issues in a very positive way. They will just keep on losing, which I don't have a problem with. Residents of Bull Savannah in St. Elizabeth took to the streets to protest over Friday night's police shooting of a 30-year-old man who is allegedly mentally ill. Family and friends protested across from the Junction Police Station where the shooting took place, demanding justice. The police say the man went into the station about 10 o'clock Friday night, attacked an officer, and his colleagues went to his assistance. During a tussle, the man was shot and taken to hospital where he was admitted on the police guard. Two police were also injured and treated at hospital. But protesters insist that the man is no wrongdoer and the police could have handled the situation better. We go to church way back then. When we come down here in the morning, when we go in there, I'm saying, here, say, yellow tape draw down here last night. What, what it went do? They say, come in this station with a half a buckle. We turn to one of the police and say to him, say, I hope you don't have the half a buckle with the fingerprint, the funny. The Emma no drink drug and he no drink beer, he no drink nothing at all, I'm mad The Independent Commission of Investigations is probing the shooting. This is the second incident involving a man said to be mentally ill at the Junction Police Station this year. In January, a, a resident of Red Bank went to the station where he stole a police uniform, went back to his community and directed traffic. Several persons, including a child, have been hospitalized following a motor vehicle crash along the Dyke Road in Portmore St. Catherine this morning. It's still unclear how the crash happened, but TVJ News understands that the police and private vehicles have been assisting injured persons to the hospital. A unit from the Portmore Fire Station also responded to the incident. However, up to news time, no ambulance had responded. There was that car, that car you see that they put in the record here, mm -hmm. which is uh, two persons in it. We look at the mother and the daughter. Mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. But I have to get together with some men and take out the mother, put on side shoes. But the girl that was in the driving side, mm -hmm. she was very... Look like she dead too. But I know she didn't dead. So when them come now, help you help you take her out. In the wake of the crash, residents are making an appeal to the relevant authorities. You see that road coming up here? Mm -hmm. We are just praying because they are working on the road that they run the cable already. But we are praying that they could put a stoplight here and that lump of bushes that on the right hand side need to be cleared away because when the traffic is coming from that side, from Waterford, they can't see the traffic that is coming on this straightway here. So I'm hoping and wishing that they would clear that area there so that people that are coming up can see before they come forward in the middle of the road here. My accident, I'm here very regular, right here. Following the announcement by the Transport Authority that they will begin enforcing regulations governing the wearing of uniforms by all operators of public passenger vehicles today, a number of transport operators could be seen clad in their white shirts and black pants. Corporate Communications Manager at the Transport Authority, Petra Keen Williams, says teams from the Transport Authority will be deployed to ensure compliance. Speaking with our news team this morning, the operators say they are not against the stipulated dress code. I hope it's not a nine day wonder. I hope it keep on and it not stop because the driver them look professional and look decent. New system where they um, implement now, it's alright you know, so far. You know. It look unique if you see every man come out in their uniform and working at the park as a taxi driver. Alright, so you've been here from what time this morning? I'm, from, I'm out from about 6.30. And all of your co workers are in their uniform out? Yeah, yes, miss. Then However, one taxi operator says he wanted more time to get things in place. As there's a lot of expense going into transportation. Not only road license and insurance and licensing the vehicle, but there are so much more wear and tear on the vehicle. And a man just get up to, to the, and everybody have a black pants and everybody have a black shirt. So you don't have to just do your thing. Child abuse concerns are again being raised in Clarendon with one church group conducting a peaceful protest yesterday. According to the Office of the Children's Registry, in 2018, approximately 13,000 children were abused. Members of the Church of God in Jamaica Region 3 marched through the Frankfield community yesterday. It is sad to say that today what we are seeing happening to our children, the abuse, or we despise our young people. It is sad to say that we might not have a future. The children, they're crying. They're crying for help because the persons who, who, are, who are there to protect them, they are the ones who are causing them pain. Speaking at the march, Pastor Limal Hamilton expressed the concerns for Jamaica's youth. He urged the residents to stop abusing children and charge them with the responsibility of protecting them. We are and we go now to news in sports as the Red Stripe Premier League first leg semi-finals take center stage at the National Stadium on Monday when defending champions Portmore United battle Mount Pleasant and Waterhouse take on Cavalier. Daniel Blake has the preview. Since their return to the league in 2015, Portmore United have made the semi-finals of the playoffs every season and have gone on to make the final. The defending champions will take on Mount Pleasant in the first of a two-leg semi-final tie in the opening game at the National Stadium. Portmore, finishing top of the table in the league format, not only earned them a million dollars, but also two weeks rest from the league. A rest which head coach Shavar Thomas thinks will be advantageous. It definitely gives us um, some time to rejuvenate, regenerate, and um, you know get the, 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 the people who are injured or nursing injuries to, to get um, some time to get better, as well as um, we could break our team down and, and work on some things we, 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 we needed to work on individually and collectively. Mount Pleasant may have enjoyed some rest themselves, but they had to endure a quarterfinal battle with UWI, where they came out 3-2 winners on aggregate. The St. Anne-based club has the best defensive record in the league and are unbeaten in their last 14 matches. Manager David Galloway says the team wants to continue their good run in their debut season. The team is more focused now. They know that uh, it come top four 
it is one step closer to the finals. And I mean, if we want to be in the top two as our dream and our desire is to be in the top two, and you know, we know that it only takes more commitment, more hard work, more dedication. In their three meetings this season, both teams have a win each and drew the other. Meanwhile, Waterhouse will be looking to seal a final spot for the second year running. Like Portmore, the Jewsland club has been inactive in the league for two weeks after claiming the second automatic semi-final spot. And defender Sean Laws doesn't expect any rust going into the match against Cavalier. In the mindset have to be, um, we have to be strong mentally, physically. So I think, I think we're okay. Yeah. Not worried about we haven't been playing and stuff like that. I think we're good. Um, Coach Marcel Gaze has, has done well on the break. So I think we're ready. Cavalier, on the other hand, are coming off a convincing quarter-final aggregate win over Arnett Gardens. Their recent form, added to the fact that they haven't lost to Waterhouse since 2015, gives the team and assistant coach David Layla an edge. If you watch the games, you'll see how confident these youngsters are. And they really play with confidence. They're enjoying themselves. Um, and so they've played against Waterhouse before, and they have done well. So at the end of the day, we expect them to do well. TVJ Sports Network will have live coverage of the Mount Pleasant Portmore encounter at 5.30, while the Waterhouse Cavalier game will be live on TVJ at 8.35 p.m. Daniel Blake, TVJ Sports. And that's the midday news. Primetime news is at 7 this evening. On behalf of the new sports and production teams, I'm Herman Green. Good afternoon. <laughs>